before um, I introduce Heather, I just want to put some context, I guess, around this, which is that unlike many medical conferences, certainly I've been to, that we have consumers at the forefront and centre of this because we believe they are the most important person in the room. And this isn't tokenism. This is why we go to work every day and this is why we're paid by our DHBs for those of us who work in health to do what we do. So there's a large number of consumers in this room um, and some of the jargon medically, those of us who are speaking, I would like you to turn down if possible and I'm one of the worst offenders. My colleague, uh, Laura Ellis, who's our consumer advisor on the commission, has a flag she raises every time a doctor uses jargon in a meeting and I'll be watching out for it at the back of the room. But the consumer is the most important person here, and that's why we would essentially like to open with a consumer story. Um, I am forever indebted to Heather for what she's about to talk about in the video she's about to show. It is emotional, and it will provoke strong emotions amongst you, and I warn you in advance of the things that are going to be talked about, because some people may find it quite distressing. But I think it's the most important message we can get across this conference, is to remember that at the end of every deteriorating patient, there is a deteriorating patient who has a family, a far now, and people who are emotionally affected by what we're going to talk about today. So that aside, I'd like to introduce Heather. Heather is a mother of four children. She works as a district nurse presently for Nelson Marlborough Health. She's also presented Matt's story at adverse event seminars for the HQSC and is a consumer representative for Cotted oh My, which we're going to be talking about more tomorrow. Um, she's also a consumer rep for ACC for the Adverse Events Review Governance Group for the Prevention of Treatment Injury. Supporting her is Karen Boothfield, who is the Director of Nursing for West Coast DHB. Karen began as an RN at West Coast DHB in 1991 and has worked in a variety of specialists, including PEDS, surgical aged care, medical critical care, occupational health, clinical nurse specialist, cardiology, and ADON. She's extremely well worked by the sound of things. Um, she has an interest in rural health and the specialty of generalist nursing within the rural and remote sector. So I'd like to introduce Heather and Karen to come to the stage, please. Alex, I always feel like we should re roll the red carpet out for Karen. <laughs> she has so many things after her name. So um, I'm Heather, I'm Matt's mum, and we um, made this DVD a couple of years after Matt passed away um, with support of West Coast District Health Board, um, Mobile Health and Health Quality and Safety Commission. So um, this is a remake of the first one we did which is, um, the story was there, but the quality wasn't so good because it was just done with a little hand cam. And this one is more scenario-based, so I think it's um, a bit easier to relate to as well. Mm. And um, lots of West Coast clinicians contributed and, and were actors in the uh, DVD, so they're committed to telling Matt's story, um, owning it and using it in the best way possible. So we also want to acknowledge the clinicians that were performers and, and contributed to making the making of Matt's story, which um, we're very proud of and we're really keen for it to be widely distributed. Now some of you would have seen it because it is shown at the um, adverse events um, uh, with HQSC, so um, those of you who haven't seen it, it is emotional and you will react to it, um, but that's good because it means you hold it in here in everyday practice, which is what we want people to do. So we're not going to talk too much about it, um, we're just going to let you watch it and then we can ask, answer any questions yes. afterwards. Um, but just to acknowledge Heather, she's very brave and uh, this is an incredible koha from Heather and we've worked very closely from essentially the day Matt died yeah. to today to make sure that we've um, created something that's worthwhile and worthy and meaningful and that everybody can hold with them um, across New Zealand. So and learn they, from. That's you're amazing. amazing. That's yeah. why I do it. Just, yeah. I just want people to learn from it. Yep. All right, so cool. over to you. Where do you want to go? Friday was just another ordinary day. Last day of the week for me working, because um, I worked as a district nurse. I'd come home and I was just sitting there into my cup of tea, and then I looked out the door and I could see Matt um, coming in from outside, and he was walking towards me, holding onto his right hand side and sort of leaning into it. And I looked at him and I thought, appendix. It didn't look good, so I thought, well, let's go up to the hospital and check this out. And that's where it all started.
he went straight into A and E, and um, he was seen by the surgeon on call that night. And he confirmed he had appendicitis, and that we should, you know, take it out that night. The appendectomy went well, and then um, between theatre and recovery, Matt had laryngospasm, so um, he'd stop breathing. So they bagged him, gave him reversal agents, and got him into the recovery room. And it was taking quite a while, I was waiting outside recovery, so eventually they came and got me and brought me in, and um, told me what had happened. You know, Matt, he was obviously breathing, he was, um, but he was very angry and they're having trouble calming him down. And then Matt coughed up some pink froth into his mask and um, I just watched the nurse wipe it out. So I said to the anaesthetist, um, you know, did you see that? And her answer was, oh, it's probably just trauma from intubation. Why would I question what she's telling me? Because I'm concentrating on calming him down and just being there as his mum. After that, they called the nurse from the ward to come and get Matt and take him back to the ward because they felt that he was good to go. You know, I asked Matt to go into the kids' ward because he wasn't yet 16 and they had TVs. But I did it um, un on the understanding that if there was um, any complications or any reason not to go to the ward, then that's fine, we wouldn't go there but the ward is where we went. Once we got Matt settled into his room, um, I kissed him, told him I loved him, and I said in the morning, he calmed down by then. And I remember looking at the, um, the couch bed thing beside him and thinking, oh, I could stay there and um, but yeah, he wasn't in the mood for that. <laughs> so, so I went, well, I just went out of his room and I said to the afternoon nurse, look, I'm, I'm not comfortable. You know, where are you sitting? So I checked her, um, you know, and she told me she sits at the desk right outside his room. And, you know, I also said, look, I want, it, I want you to keep him on a monitor all night and ring me for anything, or even if he just wants to talk to me, give me a call. Um, so I went home. got the phone call about uh, 6.30, 6.40 on a Saturday morning. Uh -huh. Dave answered and the nurse said to him, uh, Matt has respiratory arrested. And um, Dave had no idea what that meant. Um, uh -huh. But I remember him saying... Did you want us to come in? So I took the phone off him okay. and asked what happened. They oh, told me... What's happening? It's not breathing. That was it. You know, I just jumped out the bed and Dave's still looking at me wondering what's going on. I said, Matt isn't breathing. So I um, rushed to the hospital. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And when we got to his room, they were still bagging him. The doctor, the anaesthetist, the nurses were all either working on him or standing around and couldn't believe it. <laughs> He'd already had a lot of medication given when you resuscitate people. Uh, his pupils were really dilated, so you know at that stage we didn't know was it from the medication that he's been given or has he lost a lot of oxygen to his brain? We are unable to tell. Because that looked really bad, if you look at it from a nurse's perspective, but from a mum I could see um, they were giving him an oxygen, but he was breathing with that oxygen and he had a pulse. So he was still there. Then we um, took him on his bed down to uh, ICU and the doctors were talking with the team in Christchurch about what had gone on and 
uh, what's the best things to do for Matt so they sent a retrieval team for Matthew on the plane it took a long time to stabilize Matt every time we moved him we're just um, trying to get x-rays to see what was going on with his lungs his oxygen saturation would just dive and then it took about eight hours to get him stable enough to um, be able to move so uh, at that stage the doctor took us into a room and talked to us and said look Matt's got a five percent chance of living um, I'll take that chance from his mum and he may not even make the flight in the plane and they said one one parent can go with him in the plane I said well no way <laughs> Not after you've just told me he might not even make the plane flight so he can make room for him, which they did. And we transferred him to the plane, got him up in the air and um, it was the most stable he'd been the whole time. He was amazing. Over the following days while we were in ICU there were a lot of different specialists came in and they'd um, stand at the end of his bed and um, look at Matt. They'd look at his notes and um, and then they'd leave and you wouldn't really hear what was going on. He was connected to every machine going, he was on dialysis as well. Still just trying to get him stable, it was a few days before we were able to get him to an MRI to see what was going on with his brain. Seeing Matt lying in bed was, well, it was devastating because it's not Matt. Matt never was still. He was always on the move. He loved mountain biking with his friends. They built their own tracks as well. Telling him he couldn't do something was like a red flag to a bull. He enjoyed life, tried everything. And he didn't really care what anybody thought. And then the MRI. We got called into the, the uh, lead doctor's office and he told us how bad it was. Matt had no oxygen to his brain. Um, so he was being kept alive, just on the machines. Um, he wasn't going to survive. So um, he said once, once they turned the machines off, he would pass. Uh, but oh, I still wasn't ready. I don't think you're ever ready. Uh, so. I said, just give me one more night. No. So we did. Uh, so we got one more night with them. And I remember um, asking the nurse, the amazing nurses, saying I'd love to just take the side all night. So um, she's great. She said, I can fix that. And she went round to the side of Matt's bed. She pulled him over to the side. They made room for me. So there you go. Sit there. And I did. So I got to hug him all night. And it was wonderful. It was worth so much to me to be able to do that. And then um, the following day, um, with a lot of family around, very close friends. And they turned the uh, machines off. And I looked at the monitor for a bit. It was slowing down. And I just gave me a hug. He had the ear on his heart. I just listened to it. Slow down till it stopped beating. There you go. It's the hardest thing I've had to do in my life. After Matt died, I was still pretty much a zombie, so it took took a while to function properly again. But I was really lucky. I have amazing family and friends, so I've always had support. Really lucky to have that support. I had contact with Karen Bowsfield from the hospital. She was director of nursing there 
and she kept me up to date you know because I I remember saying to her just find out what happened that's all I want find out what happened hello Karen speaking as a DHB it's really important to take accountability when something's gone wrong I was part of the team that reviewed this case um, and you speak to people involved and get an overview of what had happened um, over that time and you review the clinical file and pull, pull it all together and get an overview and a picture of what actually had happened over those hours it's to understand what went wrong and what were the systems and processes that weren't quite right or that may have contributed to the outcome. There were a lot of reports that um, came my way because I wanted to see everything. I wanted to uh, make sure that they were doing everything they could to find out what happened. I had um, four, four different specialist anaesthetist reports, police, coroner, uh, hospital reports. I don't know, they seemed to be never ending. Um, but I just wanted to make sure I could do, I did everything that I could for Matt to find out what happened. Heather has every right to be angry about this. Matt should not have died. When Matt returned from theatre to recovery, he had a laryngospasm. And what we know following the investigation and the coroner's uh, inquest into it was that he developed negative pressure pulmonary edema and what that leads to is an accumulation of fluid in the lungs. And that should that is easily reversible. It is treatable. Uh, and there were points during Matt's 12 hours uh, post-operatively where it should have and could have been identified that that was happening and it could have been treated. And what we decided um, after we'd been through everything was that there were a series of things that may have contributed to the outcome for Matt. And as a result of that, we uh, developed a, a long list of recommendations to improve our systems and processes. What became clear through all the reports that I read was there was a huge lack of communication between um, everybody involved really. They missed a lot of symptoms. There was a lot of indicators there that was um, you know showing what was going on. But laryngospasms happen and um, but that doesn't make it normal and that's what they'd done they'd normalized the abnormal and then they didn't use any critical thinking Matt you know just a few of his symptoms he was angry he was extremely angry so you know was he hypoxic at that time possibly he was being given really high flows of oxygen 8 to 10 litres a minute and he was only saturating at around 92 percent and sometimes that was dropping even lower and this is a really fit, healthy 15-year-old kid who, even in A&E, when he was in pain, was still saturating at 100%. He coughed up pink froth into his mask. So, you know, what, what was going on at that time? So nobody put any of those things together. And they put him in the ward. So what happened during the night? You know, how many times was he alarming? What happened when it alarmed? You know, Matt started snoring during the night. Matt doesn't snore. I've never heard him snore. I, I know the nurse won't know that, but I know that's an unusual symptom, especially um, when it's really loud snoring. But, you know, if he is, why not check on him? What was happening? So there was a lot of indicators there, but nobody put, was putting two and two together. And Matt paid for that with his life. Obviously I've been through a really hard time in my life and uh, as is all my family. But um, you know the most important thing to come out of it for me is to encourage other people to speak up and for health professionals to um, realise how important it is to communicate and to be an advocate for your patients. Because I strongly believe if people had communicated and um, you know, really looked at what was happening with Matt, he'd still be alive today. And I want to stop that from happening. And all it takes is just communication. That's the biggest, biggest thing I can say.
Communicate and most importantly work together as a team. Use critical thinking, never normalise the abnormal and you know listen to your gut feeling because if something doesn't feel right then it probably isn't right. Check it out. No question's a dumb question. Just um, working together, that's like the most important thing. She might have made us one, no, to make us cut them though. I mean I had two choices when this happened. I could crawl up in a in a in a ball and just so I don't know what forget about life. But actually it wasn't a choice for me because I had a husband, I had three kids that you know that I loved very much. So um, my only way forward was to fight and uh, and it made me a stronger person because of it not because it was ever something I wanted to do but um, something I had to do Heather's story isn't about uh, naming and shaming and blaming actually it's about four key learnings that are applicable to any uh, clinical practice and we like to stress those four key learnings. The first is don't normalise the abnormal because there are dangers in normalising the abnormal. Theatre teams do see laryngospasm all of the time but actually it's not normal for the patient so the, the risks of normalising the abnormal are, are quite important to remember. The second thing we talk about is documentation and clinicians get tired of hearing it. Documentation is important because it helps us think through what might, what might be happening for the patient. It also gives us a clinical picture in its entirety down the track if we want to come back and review what might have happened for that patient in that moment. The third point is the importance of critical thinking. It's important that all of the time we're thinking what might this mean? What's going on for the patient in this moment? Then engage your brain. Don't assume that just by completing the documentation your job is done. You need to constantly be thinking what might this mean for the patient? And the final key learning is speak up. And speaking up is not just about enabling and empowering a more junior staff member to challenge and question a, a more senior clinician. It's actually about enabling anybody in that moment to speak up and part of that is listening to the patient, listening to the family and listening to our colleagues because that questioning can be really important.
yeah. <laughs> we do this. Shall I talk or do you want to talk? I'll talk. Um, I guess that says it all. Um, and Matt's not the only one. This is not the only example of this in our country. Um, this happens everywhere. People miss things. Um, what's different about this is that Heather has gifted us Matt's story and she uh, relives this experience every time it's shared. And I think we need to acknowledge that and I, I think we need to honour the fact that this is a story that's being used in this way and remember that every single one of us is, has the ability to step in uh, at any point during a patient's journey to stop this from being an outcome for somebody else. And this is why we are really keen to be part of the Deteriorating Patient Program because we, it is the crux of what happened with Matt. There were so many opportunities. I, I have read and reread and reread Matt's clinical file and, and talked to clinicians left, right and centre and if we ran a timeline up, every one of you in the room would be able to find the red flags in those 12 hours of Matt's journey where you, any one of you would be able to say, actually, here's a point where we could have intervened. Um, so that's the importance of, of this program and the work that we all collectively need to do. Um, and carry Matt's story with you. I do in everyday, my everyday practice as a director of nursing. I hold Matt with me. Um, not because he's different from any other person or the other, any other family, but because it's the reality of it and the, the uh, emotion you get from Heather doing this piece of work holds it in here and it will make a difference. Thanks, Karen. <coughs> I often think, um, hang on, shorter. <laughs> um, people may wonder, you know, I'm a nurse, why didn't I pick up on those things? Why didn't I push harder? Or, I don't know if you've been in that situation, but, oh, damn, <laughs> I'm still crying. Um, I trusted, I trusted them. PACU isn't my field, but, um, and I questioned, I questioned an anaesthetist in, in the ward, uh, well, in PACU, and her answer was, um, it's fine, probably just trauma from intubation. So I'm a nurse questioning. So imagine how somebody without medical knowledge would feel trying to question what's going on. I didn't look at the monitors. I trusted them to be doing their job. So I didn't look at what was going on because that's not my job. Matt was really angry. I um, distinctly remember him looking at a, a very tall male nurse at the end of his bed. And he looked him up and down, and he said, I'll take you on. And I was like, Matt, <laughs> Matt, <laughs> calm down. Like, he was really angry. So, you know, probably hypoxia. It's not usually like him. Um, but there were so many things going on. So, yes, he was angry. So, you know, as a mum, I'm there to calm him down. I'm there to look after him. I trusted them to do their job. My yeah. biggest mistake. Yeah. Um, no. Not your biggest mistake. No. <laughs> but, you know, trust is huge. So for me, I'm a nurse, um, you know, going into the hospital, um, or trusting in the future, which I have had to do, has been really, really hard. So I completely understand how someone without medical knowledge goes into a hospital and we're basically saying, you trust us, you know, hand your life over, we will look after you. Well, actually, that's really scary, really scary. So, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely for um, the Deteriorating Patient Programme, Kōri or Mai, because it's a pa about empowering patients, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, um, and that um, hucker at the end there, that was actually from Matt's boarding school mates. Um, that was his choice boarding school, not ours. I think he thought he was going to Harry Potter land because it was now St Boys College. <laughs> and they have an amazing, really old building. But um, he loved boarding school, absolutely loved it. Um, and yeah, that's the tribute from him. Mm, yeah. um, and also the thing at the start, I always cringe when I read that, but, um, about, you know, Matt was leaning into his side. And yeah, I've done a bit of A&E work, so I would think appendix. But also, ironically, his um, older brother had his appendix out two weeks before Matt. So um, why would I think anything would go wrong? And that was also um, one of our reasonings. We originally asked for him to go into the kids' ward because he was just under that 16 bracket. It was because Mike, his older brother, was really bored sitting in an older ward. <laughs> he had nothing to do. Um, but, you know, yeah. it, didn't, it didn't work. And that gut feeling, you know, I was never comfortable and um, because I had worked in A&E and brought patients into the kids' ward myself, I did know that the, 
where the nurses sat, and that was my questioning, was like, you know, I'm not comfortable, something's not quite right, you know, ring me, but uh, Matt was not in the mood to let me stay. So, yeah, work together. Work Listen together. to the patients, yeah. you know. They are our eyes and ears. The patients, the family, they're there all the time. Mm. They see those, um, you know, subtle changes, changes, changes that we, uh, we don't see because we, we can't be there all the time. We are time pressured. So listen to them, empower them, mm. yeah, encourage them to speak up. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Hang on. My kids still haven't seen this. Actually, they can. I think Kaylee and my daughter would cringe now seeing herself in those genie pants. Yeah, every time. <laughs> That's the point where it's tough, isn't it? And then we reach that point and hear this yeah. good then because yeah. she sees the genie pants. Yeah, yeah, I always laugh at that. Thing. So, are there any, any questions from anybody? It floors you, doesn't it? It just makes it so real. I always think it's better to ask the questions after about an hour because it sort of it needs to sink in. Yeah. So um, yeah, we're here for we all are two here. Days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> More than happy to um, yeah. answer any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can I just say how great you are to uh, bring this to um, what is really a national um, focus? And what yeah. I so we're very here here in our region. We've used her at our green ground to yeah. take that story to our hospital. And we have uh, also, uh, we're also planning to show it to as many people in our organisation as possible. And I think you're taking it on a road show. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I do. I need to mention that as well. Thank you. Yes, so um, next year, um, with the backing of ACC, I'm going around the country, so the plan is to go to every hospital, because um, we really feel that we need to take this to the ground floor workers. We need to take it to doctors and nurses, people that can prevent injury like this from happening. So... Um, and ACC and I are still trying to work out. I know they sent an email out to um, all the hospitals, but you know, if you're in the field that could get us in there, and and how we how do we get the most people to um, come to a meeting? If you can help us figure it, that out, that would be awesome. So, please, you know, make contact with me, and um, so that's the plan next year. Um, is that so? It's all about you know. Um, prevention of treatment injury and ACC uh, sort of, you know, they're really taking that tack and starting to spend more money on prevention, which is fantastic. And they'll also um, be with me, so, because um, they do have a lot of things that um, available for, that they can help hospitals with. They do have a good pot of money to help with that. Keep that in mind. Um, they're not here, are they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, I noticed on the attendees list there was someone here from ICU, and I just want to say, in, in Christchurch, they were absolutely amazing, and 12-hour shifts um, from the point of view, from the family, are absolutely fantastic, because my whole f yeah, continuity, my whole focus was met. I didn't want to have to get to know every person that looked after Matt, so having that, you know, that same person come on every night. I was only getting to know two or three people and it was so much easier. Mm. It was, and they, they understood me and I understood them. So um, I know it's hard, 12 hour shifts in ICU, but from a family's point of view, it's great. It's great. And, yep. Also, Daryl's here. Daryl Jones is here from Australia. You might, uh, Daryl, you might like to bring her over to Australia for your conference. She's been one. Who's, who's Daryl? Yeah, I went to once. Royal Melbourne Hospital and I seen, yeah. that's where I first seen the escalation programme. Yeah. I thought, yes, New Zealand needs that. Awesome. And, and we worked with the Director of Nursing to start the process around developing Matt's story, so we've been yep. working quite closely with her in the beginning stages, which was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So where's this guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, <laughs> so you're not putting your hand up, <laughs> but it's okay, I'll go. And Karen, we'll go. yeah, we'll go. Actually, because I, I, it's so important for Karen to be up here with me because this shows that actually Karen, you know, um, representing the hospital has worked with me through this. They didn't hide, they were transparent the whole way through, and from my perspective, even though it was hard to hear how bad things had gone, it also helped me to work through it really helped and um, so being transparent is fantastic even as hard as it will be for the hospital because the people involved um, unfortunately 
never spoke to me and I still find that really hard to deal with. And I'm guessing that they probably do as well because I know if I do something wrong, the first thing I do is put my hand up because that's how I work through it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So Anyone thanks, else? Karen. Oh, that's all right, Heather. Anything else? Anything? All right, no? lovely. Right. Okay, thank you.